Hello, welcome to this talk about FreeBSD. FreeBSD uh, and FreeBSD is not Linux. Uh, some background about the talk. Uh, I've been I've been going to to conferences and fast fast uh, fast them for instance and stuff like that. And you talk to a lot of people and they go like, "What's FreeBSD?" And well, FreeBSD is an open source operating system, a POSIX-like open open source operating system. And people go like, "Is that a Linux distribution?" Well, no, it's not a Linux distribution. <laughs> Spoiler alert. So, in this talk, uh, I'll I'll try to give an overview of what FreeBSD is, FreeBSD is, and how it came to be, and some of the features it has. And it was this will be a very high level. Some some of the topics could be a one day lecture style thing. So. From from a very high high level perspective, and uh, first bit about me, uh, my name is Nicholas Sising. Uh, you can reach me there, or several other other mailing mailing addresses. Uh, I'm an IT consult consultant based in Stockholm, in Sweden, uh, where I do systems administration. Unfortunately, mostly Linux, a bit of IT security, DevOps stuff like that. And when I'm not at work, uh, I do FreeBSD stuff. Uh, I'm a FreeBSD committer since 2012. I've been a FreeBSD contributor for for over 10 years. And since it's 2019, it probably means closer to 15 years by now. Uh, so, so I've been working on FreeBSD for for quite a while. And I I work mostly in ports. I pretend I write documentation sometimes, but. Time is limited, so I work mostly in ports, and I will explain what port is, ports is as part of the presentation. Uh, so first off, uh, how many in here has heard of FreeBSD before? Oh, full highs, thank you. How many people are using FreeBSD in some capacity? Not as many, with a few hands still. So uh, how many people has, has, it has or have used a PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4? Oh, we have plenty of FreeBSD users, users in here. So the operating system on play PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4 is, is based on FreeBSD. They took some version of FreeBSD, made some, some Sony took a version of FreeBSD, made some changes to it, and developed, in, developed, it, developed it into, into the operating system on PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. So another thing, how many of you work in storage and have heard of NetApp? Or, or working with NetApp. NetApp is using FreeBSD. Iceland, which is another storage appliance for which I don't have any picture, is also using FreeBSD. So more FreeBSD users. There are seats in the front. I think there are some seats in the back if you prefer. How many people in here are using or using Netflix to view you have a question? Or raising your hand? Huh? Yeah. Uh, how many people are using Netflix to view things? Quite half the room. So yeah, Netflix uses FreeBSD. Every byte, well, not every byte, but every byte of a movie or documentary or TV series is served by FreeBSD. Uh, the Netflix Open Connect appliance is is FreeBSD based. It's well, almost all FreeBSD. Uh, so about a third of internet traffic, or 30% or something, of internet traffic at peak hour is, is served by FreeBSD. It, I think Netflix is getting close to serving 100, giga 100 gigabits out of a single, single socket box by now. They've been pushing the limits for, for a number of years. Any WhatsApp users? Unfortunately. Well, WhatsApp uses FreeBSD, unless Facebook has changed it recently. But WhatsApp is built, everything is built on top of FreeBSD. Apple, Mac OS, or OS X, or what's it called this, the, the today, is, is based on FreeBSD. Well, not everything, but the POSIX layer and the, the Unixy parts of, of Mac OS X is, is based on, on a version of FreeBSD. Uniper, networking, also FreeBSD. UNOS, 
So the router or switch management interface, it's FreeBSD. So as you can see, FreeBSD, and this is just a few of the places where you, ca places where you can find FreeBSD. It's, I mean, we have almost all of you here, here are FreeBSD users in some way. So as you can see, it's, 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 in, a multi it's in multiple places but it's, it's not very heard of, or not very known. So, to dive into it, what is FreeBSD? The, the very, very short, perhaps almost ev elevator pitch of what FreeBSD is. Perhaps the conference pitch of what FreeBSD is. FreeBSD is a complete operating system, in contrast to Linux, which is a kernel, and some tools. FreeBSD is a complete operating system. Uh, this means that the kernel, the base utilities, everything is developed together as one repository. Or in one, one repository. And it's everything released together. And together with the glue to actually build something, the loads. FreeBSD is also documentation. We have a lot of documentation both within the system as manual pages, the FreeBSD handbook. Uh, and so on. Some of it, unfortunately, is perhaps not as up-to-date as it should be. But in general, we have got good documentation. We have plenty of documentation. Oops. Sorry. Uh, FreeBSD is also over 30,000 third-party packages. So FreeBSD is a lot more than just an operating system. Uh, and these packages, it's similar to, to Jam or to Apt or similar things like that. So you can probably find your favorite software in there if it's not part of the base system. Lastly, FreeBSD is a community. Uh, of it's a community of people working together. For some reason, the clicker keeps clicking even when I don't want it to click. Uh, sorry about that. FreeBSD is a community. Uh, it's a bunch of people working together. Uh, it's one of the oldest open source projects in existence. I will give a brief overview of history in a, in a bit. Uh, it's also one of the largest democratically run open source projects. <coughs> so there is, no, there is no Linus Torvalds. There is no man or woman or person in charge at the top. So this, this, is, this is the very, very short overview of what FreeBSD is. But how did we get here? So as, as you've seen when my clicker has been clicking, or maybe I've been clicking on it without noticing, uh, next step we'll talk about is, is the history, how we got here. And a slight disclaimer, uh, I wasn't really around at the beginning, so I don't know everything of it. And there are people who've done much better jobs at talking about the history of BSD and history of computing. So if you're really interested uh, Wikipedia is a good start. I know Kirk McCusick has recorded lectures about the history of FreeBSD and history of BSD in general. So this is just the, the short overview of, of history. So uh, in the beginning of time, there was apparently something called Multix. Well, and then came Unix from Bell Labs in, in the US. And uh, Bell Lab, uh, version 6 of Unix came to University of Berkeley in California. And some people there found out that, well, there are some features missing, or there are some things we don't like. So, so they started developing patches for, for version 6 of Bell Labs Unix. A bunch of different things such as the X editor 
in and later the VI editor. A Pascal compiler and a bunch of other tools. And these patches, I mean people, and by people I mean the 40-ish Unix installations and computers in the world at this time, they started asking for, for these add-ons. So in 1977, uh, these patches, uh, Bill Lloyd started to compile these patches into something more similar to a distribution or something, and they call it the Berkeley Software Distribution. And this was released in March of 1978. You still needed at t you still needed Bell Labs Unix or later at t Unix to, to use this. It was just a patch set on top. And you still needed, which will be important later, you still needed the license from at t to, to actually use this. So what happened? Apparently, the American DARPA, the Defense Research Something Something Agency, uh, they needed a version of an operating system for this, um, the one true operating system. Previously, different parts had used different things, and apparently, militaries are big on standardization. 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 So uh, they started offering some money to to the computer research group at the University of California in Berkeley. And out of this came things like sockets and an IP stack and several other tools. So, so the BSD distribution or the BSD patch set on top of Unix, it grew and I mean more and more releases came to be. At this point in time, I think we're in the middle of the 80s by now, or even later in the 80s. Uh, someone realized that perhaps this at t code was not the greatest, greatest thing to, having, ha to have laying around, because it requires all the users of BSD Unix to also have an at t license. And those were apparently perhaps not the cheapest ones to get by. So work started to remove uh, the at t code from, uh, from BSD Unix to avoid, the having the, the to avoid the need for an at t license. And uh, this led up to what's called networking release one. And this was made available even to people without an at t license. Previously, you'd always needed an at t license to use this, but now you don't. And this was released in June of 1989. This code was also ported to uh, the i386, the new i386 computer from Ento, which is the descendant I have here today. And this was done in two, two ways. There was the free 386 BSD port, which was done by by uh, William Yolitz, and a proprietary BSD slash 386, later called BSD OS, by a company called Berkeley Software Design or BSDI. And uh, 386 BSD is important because that's that's the origin of of FreeBSD. And now we are now we're in time, we're the early 1990s. So the FreeBSD project started from, from the code of uh, 386 BSD in 1993. The 386 BSD project itself was, was kind of short-lived. On the other hand, the other side of things, you had the BSDI proprietary or proprietary BSD license, and and this AT&T found out about this. And they claim they still own copyright uh, to, to parts of this code because, as I said earlier, you previously you needed AT&T 
licensed users. So AT&T sued. And they didn't only sue BSDI, they also sued University of Berkeley in California and the state of California. And during this time, Linux kind of grew up to the start of Linux kind of came. So the at t lawsuit was settled. A couple of, I don't, I don't know, a couple of files of code needed to be rewritten. Some, some things needed co copyright statements, stuff like that. And in 1994, a new release of, of uh, BSD and a new release of FreeBSD happened. And this meant that, that the code from Berkeley, the BSD code, was finally free. And I need some something to drink because I forgot that one. So, uh, while standing over here, sorry. Uh, from the free 86 BSD code, three major projects sprung up. At the start, we have NetBSD, which started in 1993, uh, and their aim, uh, their goal is is to be as portable an operating system as possible. They run on everything. FreeBSD, which is a topic for today, also came out of the same code, the 386 BSD code, in 1993. And the main goals for FreeBSD is to be a mainstream performant and secure operating system. So run on mainstream platforms and run on mainstream hardware, trying to, to cram out as much as possible out of this hardware. So 100 gigabits for Netflix, for instance. We also have OpenBSD, which is the last of the free big BSD, BSD operating systems. And that's a fork of NetBSD that happened in 1996. There are several smaller, several smaller projects that happened later. Dragonfly BSD, which is a fork of FreeBSD. TrueOS, which is a downstream project from FreeBSD. FreeNAS, another downstream project from FreeBSD. MacOS X, MacOS, as I mentioned, is also descendant. And uh, these, these, all these, well, all of the NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Dragonfly BSD, and so on, they are separate operi operating systems. So they have their own user land, their own kernel, their own tools. There is no BSD distribution, there is no common BSD kernel. Of course, I mean, we share code between each other, because why, why even, well, at least you can try to avoid the inventing the wheel. Sometimes it's, it's very fun to do. So, as I said in the beginning, uh, a whole bunch of companies use FreeBSD. I use FreeBSD. I'm not a company, but I use FreeBSD. And it's, it's widely spread out over, uh, around the world. Uh, in fact, I don't think you can send a package across the internet without at some point touching a FreeBSD system or a BSD system. I don't have any sources for that, but my best guess is. But why should you use it, and why are all these big companies using FreeBSD? So, uh, over the years, FreeBSD has developed some great tools, and there has been some great innovation. For instance, the Windows NT kernel back in the day took the TCP IP stack from FreeBSD, and TCP IP was an original BSD invention, or the sockets were an original BSD invention, and the TCP stack from FreeBSD wound up in Windows. There's several other examples of tools. Some companies use used entire operating system, some companies use parts of it. FreeBSD has a these days has a mature release module. Uh, as I said, we've been going on since 1993. You can find all the code since, since day one, basically, in our subversion repository. Yes, we use subversion. There is a Git clone of the subversion repository. Uh, we have a, release, a mature release module with uh, releases every six to nine months. We try to keep within a stable release branch, what is, as we say, 
we try to keep things, or we do our best to keep things compatible. So for instance, on the elev FreeBSD 11 release branch, if I compile something for FreeBSD 11.0, it will still run on the upcoming FreeBSD 11.3. There is a small asterisk because sometimes people make mistakes. But in general, so within the release branch, we try to keep something, things compatible. It's not just someone lobbing a new kernel with new interfaces over a wall somewhere. And this comes from, from having everything developed at the same place. We also have our business-friendly license, as people like to say. And this is one of the major differences between, between Linux and between BSD. So the LGPL or the, L the GPL is, as far as I understand it, if you write, if you modify code under GPL, you have to distribute it under GPL. So the GPL is contiguous, in in a way. Uh, the BSD license is very short, and it basically says says you're free to do whatever you do want to do with this code or these binaries. You just you know give us some credit from for originally writing it, and that's it basically. This means that, for instance, Sony can take the FreeBSD operating system slap on their own things and distribute it in the PlayStation 3 or PlayStation 4. Jonas can take FreeBSD, add their own secret sauce on top of it, and distribute it as Jonas. And some people are okay with this, some are, are not. That's why we have multiple licenses. But that's one of the major differences. So if you're creating a downstream project, an appliance based on FreeBSD, you don't have to be perhaps as careful about just redistributing your changes and things like that. There are some tools in the FreeBSD-based system that are still GPL-based because there is currently no alternatives. Work is ongoing on getting rid of the GPL license. But the kernel is, for most part, completely free. We also have a open and at least from my point of view friendly and nice community uh, is one of the main reasons I use FreeBSD or I keep using FreeBSD, keep developing FreeBSD is I've met great people all around the world and I have friends all around the world. Granted, it might be a bit hard to, to, to get the foot in the door, unfortunately. It's something we have to improve. Our onboarding process has to be improved. But it's an generally, it's an open and friendly and nice community. And from a company perspective, it's fairly easy to get patches in. For instance, Netflix contributes code. Juno Juniper contributes some code. Sony perhaps contributes code, but we don't know about it. And so on. As I mentioned earlier, another reason perhaps to use, use FreeBSD, and something that I want to touch some more on is, is this complete operating system, because that's another thing that sets us apart from, from Linux. As I said, it's a complete operating system. This means that the kernel and all the drivers and user land utilities, base user land utilities, I mean, your file, file mishandling utilities, ls, copy, move, stuff like that, volume manage, volume, ma volume manager for disks, everything. This is developed together, and it's released together. So there is no risk of, if I get FreeBSD 12.0 release, there is no risk of some tools not operating with other tools or anything like that. And everything is hopefully tested together. So there is no, no concept of a BSD distribution. So uh, in Linux, a distribution is what you get when you, someone takes tools from all these different places, slap them together, hopefully test them, and distribute them as a unit. In FreeBSD, that's automatic since everything is developed. Everything in the core operating system is developed together. We get that. 
FreeBSD is also distributed with all the developer tools needed to start working on FreeBSD. Granted, you don't get your favorite editor. You, you have to live with, with VI or Ed. But compilers, debuggers, build glue to actually build it, tools to build it, such as make and things like that. Everything is included in the base package. So if I install the base system, I get everything I need to start working on FreeBSD, to update it, to compile it, to modify it. So I don't need to fetch things from different places. On top of that, we have a packaging system, as I hinted about. Uh, it's called ports. And this is where you get third-party packages. So GNOME and Xorg and Emacs and Vim and, you know, 30,000 other pieces of software. And this is similar to, to, to Apt or to Jum or to anything. The difference is the base system is not, not packaged, not yet anyway, by, by a tool like that. So the system, when it comes out of the box, it's, it's ready for development. If, if your sense of development is, well, C or C++ code in the kernel, but, or base utilities. But it's ready for development. And if you need something else, bring Python, Go, Rust, it's in the package system. So you can get that as well. So that was an overview of FreeBSD, what FreeBSD is, and the uh, history of FreeBSD and BSD. Let's move on to, to some of the features of FreeBSD. What, what can this operating system actually do? And what can it do for you? So start off, FreeBSD has good hardware support. We support most of the latest things. Um, some desktop hardware may lag a bit behind <coughs> because unfortunately we don't have access to as much developer time and as much insight as, as Linux, but most hardware is well supported, especially server hardware. Several companies support FreeBSD with drivers and documentation for, for their hardware. Um, we support multiple CPU architectures. So, you know, your regular i386 and AMD64 stuff or x64 stuff, but also ARM, ARM64, MIPS, PowerPC, PowerPC64. I still think Spark64 is around, but that's kind of dying. We also support something that's called Risk Five, which is a fairly new thing which means it's probably at least five years old at this point. Another feature of FreeBSD that I find very attractive is I find it quite easy to configure. The base system is easy to configure. It's, you find the source, you find the configure place, it's, it's, it's in one place basically. It's not spread out in multiple configura fi configuration files. It's not like Etsy sysconfig on Red Hat or stuff like that. So it's fairly easy to configure, fairly easy to use. Uh, we have file systems, obviously. <coughs> it's very hard to have a complete operating system without any file systems. You can probably try. So we have the battle-hardened, you know, ancient from BSD at Berkeley origin UFS or fast file system or universal file system or you know in Sweden we have a saying that a beloved kid has many names so I'm not sure if UFS is beloved but it has many names and this this file system has been is been around it exists in in different versions in I mean all the BSDs it exists in a lot of commercial Unixes. Solaris, for instance, H HP, UX, and stuff like that, in different versions. They're not entirely compatible. So this is the battle-hardened old file system, and 
There's been some changes through, th through the years. It has journaling now. It didn't have to the beginning. So you don't have to do F-check since forever and stuff like that. We also have the, the, the slightly newer uh, file system, CFS. Uh, CFS, the port of CFS, CFS to FreeBSD was completed, or well, the port is never completed because it's kept keep on updated. But it first saw the light of day in 19 in 27, so over 10 years ago. Uh, I'll just touch CFS briefly because, I mean, talking about CFS is at least an hour or maybe a whole day, and I think Johan will be be angry with me if I take that much time. <laughs> so CFS is a file advanced file system and a volume manager smacked together. It came originally from Solaris. It was ported, as I said, to FreeBSD in 2007. Uh, and in FreeBSD, it's a first class citizen. It's, it's developed and released as part of the base system. You can install, on a CF you can install your computer, your operating system, your boot drive and everything on CFS from the installer. There's no need to fetch fetch packages or kernel modules or anything from, from anywhere else. Um, we also have a bunch of other file systems, FAT, uh, Fuse, and so on and so forth. Moving on to security, we have stuff like mandatory access control, which is higher grade security, I don't know. It's basically you have to give everything access rights. Uh, it's It might be liked by, you know, secure instances, militaries and stuff like that. I cannot say I understand it completely, but if you need it, it's there. We have an audit framework to, you know, audit syscalls and what's going on on your, on your very secure system. And we have a tool called Capsicum which is a process capabilities and containment tool. So basically a process, it tells, I need to do this and this and this and all of this. And this is my understanding of it. It's, it's also a full day, at least, talk. But so a process can declare, I only need to do these things. And there are some, there are some things in the kernel to, to tell the process that, well, you're not allowed to do this or stuff like that. If you try to do something, you declare that you want to. And there's also some helpers in the kernel because certain things like DNS resolvers need things that perhaps you cannot provide your process. So there's services to help with that. We also have Yales, which is another process containment tool. As I've written here, it's, it's the original container platform because it kind of is. It was invented, invented in the late 1990s, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a way of, it started as a, sh a CH root on steroids, but it's a way of encapsulating processes in their own runtime environments, basically. So the process, the different yells, they share the same kernel and stuff like that, but they they have separate file system namespaces. They cannot talk to each other apart from using you know, regular networks and stuff like that. So for instance, you can have your web server in one Yale, and you can have your other web server in another Yale, and you can have your mail server in, one in, in a third Yale, or you can have, uh, I mean, if you're a hosting company, you can have one web server in one Yale each for all your customers, and you can give, give your customers the root within that Yale that means they don't have the root on the host. So it's a fairly, it's a very lightweight, since they all share the same kernel, it's a very lightweight virtualization thing because there's no actual virtualization. We also have a virtualized network stack, so you can even give DCLs separate network stacks. Or originally they shared a network stack, which perhaps gave some, some, uh, some problems, but these days you can have a completely separate ver network stacks for all your areas. So this is the original original container platform. Solaris based their stones on it. And I guess in a way it stood grant for, as an idea for, for the container platforms in Linux of today. 
And I still don't think anyone has actually managed to, to break out of jails. There's been some incidents where bad siblings and stuff like that in the default installation has caused issues, but I don't think anyone has actually broken out of a jail without using something else. So we talked about networking and TCP IP. Uh, BSD is the original TCP IP implementation. Uh, today, FreeBSD has full IP version 4 and IP version 6 support. Uh, we have a thing called pluggable TCP stacks. This means that you can change between different congestion control algorithms, things like that. I, am, I know a bit about networking, but I'm not a network engineer, so I don't understand all of it. But, I mean, when TCP IP was invented, you had long strings, which were very small. These days we have short strings that are huge. So there are different ways of handling this and you can plug in different congestion control algorithms, different different ways of tuning your TCP IP stack in FreeBSD to, as I said, push 100, 100 gigabits. We also have several firewalls. IPFV is the most, is the original ones. We have uh, PF, which originally came from OpenBSD, speaking of code sharing. Stuff like that. We have we have a third one, but we don't really talk about that one. So uh, most arch FreeBSD ar most architectures FreeBSD support uses the LLVM toolchain as opposed to the GCT toolchain. So we use Clang, we use LLDB, which is the debugger. We use LLD, which is the linker. And C, C and C++ toolchains are are not super interesting these days. So we'll skip that. FreeBSD was the first port outside of Solaris of Dtrace, as far as I know. Uh, and Dtrace is, is another, you know, day to day lecture thing. But it's, it's a way to, to do dynamic tracing of processes. You can see inside system calls. And it gives you system transparency. And this is, is a great tool for debugging, for performance evaluations, and things like that. And this is built into, this is comes as part of the base system. And then there are some tools and ports for, for easier management. But this is part of the FreeBSD base system. And it's a first class system. We also have a hyp hyp uh, hypervisor because who doesn't have a hypervisor these days? In FreeBSD, it's called Beehive. Uh, and this is also, this hypervisor is also ported to Illumos. And it's protection ready, it's ready for use. Uh, FreeBSD can also use on send both as a client of sorts and even as a DOM zero, I think it's called in send, send language. We also have this, the Linux system call emulation layer. So within the FreeBSD kernel, there is a compact layer that makes it possible to run, not all, but a lot of Linux binaries. And apparently I haven't done the benchmarks myself, but in some cases they even run faster. So it's possible, for instance, to set up a jail with a tool with a stack, with a software stack from, from Linux and run it within FreeBSD. Or you can use Beehive if you need something else, such as Windows. You can run Windows in Beehive. I talked a bit about ports and packages. So ports is, ports is the FreeBSD packages basically, and here we go, I'm back. I probably touched the keyboard. Uh, ports is the source from which packages are built, in short. Uh, it used to be that for on FreeBC you had to compile all your third-party packages from ports by yourself. Uh, these days we do have binary packages and we have had it for quite some time. And these packages are built using the ports as source. And ports is a set of make files and glue to tell you how you build this specific software, such as Emacs, on FreeBSD. And this is all built by Poudrier, which is the tool that we use to build packages on FreeBSD. 
And Pudrier is, is the tool used to build official packages. You can also run this yourself. So for instance, if you have company internal software or if you need special compiled flags and stuff like that, you can use Pudrier to build your own package set, point your FreeBSD hosts to, well, here's my packages. Use this to build instead. So uh, that was a bit about the the, f the, the FreeBSD features. Uh, I also want to mention a couple words about about how the FreeBSD project is run. As I said in early in the presentation, FreeBSD is one of the largest and oldest s open source software projects, and it's also one of the oldest and largest democratically run open source software projects. So FreeBSD uh, is led by a core team. The core team is nine people, and they are elected every every two years from from the group of active. It's elected by the group of active FreeBSD committers, and an active FreeBSD committer is someone that's committed code. I think, at least in the latest year or something like that. And we uh, we peop we elect from ourselves a group of people that acts sort of like a steering committee for FreeBSD. They handle, in some some cases probably, which technical direction we want to take. They can act as arbiters of conflict when people are disagreeing on technical solutions to things. And they also decide who gets a commit set, basically. We also have underneath core or starting up more and more working groups because it turns out nine people sometimes is too few people. So for instance, I'm part of the graphics working group for people interested in in graphics and Xorg and stuff on FreeBSD. There's a networking working group. There is probably a toolchain working group. There is a bunch of working groups. So, so this is this is how the project is managed and set up. And this is how we try to make progress. I also want to mention the FreeBSD Foundation. Uh, the FreeBSD Foundation supports the FreeBSD project. It's it's a separate thing, but then also not a separate thing. Uh, this is the entity that manages, for instance, donations. If you if you have money left over, you can donate to FreeBSD project, and the FreeBSD Foundation uses this to support the FreeBSD project. They have a couple of developers on payroll. They sponsor conferences, sponsor developers to travel to conferences, things like that. Things you need money for. And the FreeBSD Foundation also acts as a legal entity for the FreeBSD project, so they. Apparently, you need to keep track of your IP, such as logos and trademarks and things like that. So the FreeBSD Foundation acts as a legal entity and if, if it's needed. So where can you get FreeBSD? I mean, I've been talking about FreeBSD for 45 minutes now. And perhaps, I hope all of you want to try that. Even, you know, not just on... PlayStation 4 or you knows. So some resources. The main one, the FreeBSD website, www.freebsd.org. We also, have, as I mentioned, we use Subversion. Uh, we do have a GitHub mirror. It's read-only. Unfortunately, at least currently, you can't make pull requests on GitHub. But w to start working, we have a GitHub repository. Then we use Bugzilla for managing PRs. We have mailing lists. We have lots of mailing lists. And and we have the FreeBSD handbook as a starting resource, which is sort of the user documentation. So these are starting points if you want to try that. There are ready-made images for VirtualBox or VMware and stuff like that, installation uh, ISOs, so on. That's 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 about what I had. So, uh, any questions? Any any comments? Any flame wars? I guess it's run on Amiga. Yeah. Uh, hi, I just wanted uh, to ask a little bit about uh, Linux syscall um, translation. Yep. Uh, so last time I tried it out, it was like quite impressive, but not at the level which Illumnos achieves. If you know their project, 
but where you can run basically any Docker container right out of the box. On okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with the with the Illumis one. Uh, I know. I mean, syscalls have to be implemented. There might be some missing. Uh, I'm not familiar with what Illumis has done. In I'll guess I'll yeah, have to look that. Yeah, there is. Do you are you familiar with Smart OS? Yep. Yeah. Well so name at least. Yeah, so you can basically run any Docker container out of the box, uh, and it's basically transparent. So it's uh, for me uh, using using it in a professional environment where Linux is very widespread. It usually makes it easier to convince people to use that operating system. So, but yeah, if you don't know it, then it's fine. I've I'm not very familiar with the Luminous, unfortunately. Yeah. But if if the FreeBSD Linux is Cisco compat layer is not enough, you can always use run it in Beehive. Hmm. But sorry for not knowing about the Luminous. <laughs> it's fine. I just yeah. wanted to ask. Yeah. More questions? I think we still have some time. We have plenty of time. We have plenty of time, yeah. even. Eight minutes. It's awesome. No more hands? No, no more hands. One more hand. Uh, you mentioned that a couple of companies have contributed back uh, code. Yep. Uh, do you also are you also aware of uh, how many companies like support the project with uh, donations, funding? Uh, the FreeBSD Foundation has a list of both company and individu individual donors. Uh, I don't know the list on top of my head, but there are several ones. So if you go to the FreeBSD Foundation website, there is a list of of, uh, of donors, and I mean, in some cases, companies want to donate, but they don't want to know that they have donated because perhaps they don't want n want people to know that they're using FreeBSD. So in some cases, donations are anonymous. Perhaps, yeah, but there is a list. Yeah, um, I'm curious how much maintenance, like old uh, architectures, are. Like, for example, you mentioned PowerPC. Uh, being still maintained, which I lost with Debian, for example. Yep. Uh, and like, how long can we expect things to live? <laughs> <laughs> that was not the easiest question in the world. Uh, not being a kernel kernel developer, I don't know. There are discussions about some of the older architectures, such as Spark 64, being a burden rather than something that's still useful. Uh, Unfortunately, I, I can't really answer your question. It depends on, for a, for an architecture to be viable, there has to be people using it and working on it. There has to be hardware that's readily available. I guess in the power case of PowerPC, it has some benefit of there being a PowerPC 64 port. So without knowing very much about PowerPC and PowerPC 64, there might be some some way for it to live on that that way and stuff like that, similar to to i386 and x x6 and uh, AMD64 or x64. But I mean, the as I said, the platform has to be avail available, hardware has to be available. It has to have enough performance to actually run FreeBSD because you need. I mean, you don't need the largest computer in the world, but you need at least a bit of RAM and a bit of CPU to run it. Uh, I know that was the best non-answer in the world, but that's I think that's that's the best I can give you, unfortunately. Do we have a last question? Otherwise, I see. Would you consider uh, FreeBSD to be more secure than uh, Linux? <laughs> <laughs> yes or no? Uh, no matter how I answer this one, I will get tomatoes thrown at me somehow. So I think I think I will not answer it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I've I mean I know a bit of IT security and stuff like that, but I'm not an IT security researcher, so I I'm too much of a coward to actually, you know, stick my shin out, as we say in Swedish, and and give an 
give a good answer. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, that was it. Uh, if you have more questions or want to know more and want or want to try it out and anything, I'm here today and tomorrow. Otherwise, you can reach me on email, on Twitter. My name is really, really easy to Google, so you will probably find a way to contact me. Thank you. <laughs>